We are starting a brand new, brand new sermon series. Open up your Bibles with me to the book of Ephesians. This is that one time that I wish we all had paper Bibles so I could hear you guys flipping through the pages and we could get a good smell of that bonded leather. Like I wish we could do that right now because I want to work through the book of Ephesians before we start this new series. So I want you to get an idea of the book of Ephesians. The whole series is going to be called In Him is the name of the series. And today is going to be on verse one, verse one. And by the way, I think I've found about four sermons just in verse one alone. So this will give you the idea of the time frame of this message. We'll probably be into it for all of 2017. No joke. Ephesians is going to be our sermon series for a long, long time. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to open up your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 1. And I want you to see how this book is written. Then I'm going to give you some awesome facts about it. When you look at Ephesians chapter 1 verse 1, this is going to be that verse I'll be on for a little bit. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in what city? In Ephesus. Everybody say Ephesus. Thank you. That's where we get the name Ephesians from. Many books of the Bible are named after geographical locations. Uh, Colossians after Colossia. Philippians after Philippi. Thessalonians after Thessalonica, where actually my uh, wife's family is from. Uh, Her father and mother, my in-laws, were born in Thessaloniki, as they say it. So we are learning about God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. So Paul's the apostle. He's writing to the people about the will of God, and that's today's sermon. The people there are called God's holy people. If you have an older translation, it says the saints, the, uh, the saints in Ephesus, that's the city, and the faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, if you notice that phrase right there, in Christ Jesus, is where we get the sermon series in him. 27 times in the book of Ephesians is the phrase, in him or in Christ. So that is a predominant theme of the book. Paul starts off in chapter 1 with the introduction of who he is and who they are. He then goes into some of the greatest language of the Bible about the identity of Christians, who we are in Christ, that because of Christ, we are seated in heavenly realms, blessed with every spiritual blessing, that we've been in love, predestined to adoption of sonship through Jesus Christ. I mean, those things right there will blow your mind, that literally your spirit is in heavenly places right now connected to God. because God is a spirit and so God can transcend matter, space, and time and put you where he is. Put you in a place where he is and there in that place you're blessed with every spiritual blessing as you're walking here in this world. I don't mean you're in two places at one time. I just mean you're hardwired into God. That's what I'm trying to say. Those of you little techie, you have a Cat 5 line, a DSL line between you and God right now. And literally that places you in a position of blessing. Then the Bible goes on to say that we have forgiveness of sins. And this is a concept that Paul will use in the book of Ephesians as he goes on. And it also brings up the idea of predestination, that no one here is a Christian by accident, that everyone here has been a part of God's purpose and his will. And then when you get a little bit later on into the the first chapter here, he now begins to say a prayer of thanksgiving for these people. And he says, since I've heard about your faith, faith and love that you have. I can't stop giving thanks to God for you. And that's the kind of church we want to be, a church that always gives praise to God and has that reputation. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that beautiful? And as a matter of fact, this is the only letter that Paul wrote uh, that didn't come with problems or rebuke or correction. This is a letter simply meant to teach and love uh, the people. Then we get into chapter 2, which is the, uh, uh, the salvation message of Paul. Think about Paul being a traveling preacher. That's what really apostle means. He's a sent out one, apostilion in the Greek, sent out to start new churches. And as he's going around from city to city, and this time it's the Roman world, and specifically in the, the Roman world, it's Asia Minor. We'll look at a map of this in just a moment. But as he's starting these churches, he kind of has a message, a drumbeat that he's following. 
following, a dance that he likes the dance, if you know what I'm talking about, a little merengue. Every time he shows up to the dance floor, he does that dance. And uh, the grace dance is his dance. The message of grace is his message. Everywhere he goes, he's preaching this message of grace. Well, Ephesians chapter 2 is where he basically lays it out in the most succinct and the best way the Bible has ever heard up until this point. We don't give the credit to Paul necessarily because we believe that scripture is God's breath through Paul, but obviously Paul had to be obedient to write it out without interfering with his own opinion. And this is a beautiful passage about the grace of God. As a matter of fact, we get one of our confessions of faith from this passage. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God. Now, as you continue on into chapter 2, you see in verse 11 and onward that there is a great mystery that's being revealed through Paul's preaching that many people had forgotten, and they didn't remember the prophets, and that was that God had a plan for all people, not just the Jewish people. The Jewish people were the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and most of the Bible is written towards them, but there were prophecies in those Jewish writings that said God would bring in the nations, that God would have a plan for the whole world. Now Paul reveals it, and the way he breaks it down there is he says, there's a plan for the uncircumcised and the circumcised. And if you don't know what circumcision is, just ask your neighbor after service. I'm sure they'd love to teach you about that. And he begins to say that he himself, talking about Jesus, is our peace because he has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. We now learn that there's only one race, the human race, and only one nation, God's holy nation, the church of Jesus Christ. Now, of course, he still cares about Israel. He has a plan for that specific group of people, but in the church, in the body of Christ, there is no more Jew and Gentile. We are all one. And then he says one of the most beautiful things that I can't wait to get to, because his purpose was to create in himself, everybody say, in him, one new humanity. You see a lot of people today want to be social justice warriors and talk about what we need, but oftentimes they divide us according to race, they divide us according to the haves and the have-nots, divide us according to Democrat, Republican, but here you see Jesus, in Jesus, the purpose was to create a new humanity that was all about God. See, I, I don't care about a white man or a black man, I care about the God man, Amen. A white man and a black man were arguing about who Jesus was up in heaven. Is he black or is he white? And then they, they both died. They showed up at the pearly gates and he said, Que paso? They both were wrong. He was a Latino man. No, I'm kidding. I, I kid. I kid. But listen, we don't need to get caught up in racism, socialism. And I do believe in social work, but we ought not to think that what we do here is really the most important thing. It is important here, but the most important thing is the kingdom coming and the one new humanity God is bringing. Amen? And then we learn that we, as we go into chapter 3, that God had this plan for the Gentiles from a, a long time ago, and that Paul was given this awesome revelation. But we get a little bit of insight that I'll be mentioning in just a moment, that he says, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. Guess where Paul is writing the letter of Ephesians from? He's in prison. He's locked up. And why is he locked up? Because he's gone to preach the gospel to pagans, to people who don't want to even learn about the Jewish faith, let alone about Jesus Christ, the promised Jewish Messiah. They put him in prison. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the story of how the church of Ephesus got started later. But let's keep reviewing the book of Ephesians that we'll be going through for quite a long time this year. I hope you're not bored by the Bible. Are you ready for me to start telling you stories I learned from Oprah Winfrey? Or do you guys want to keep hearing the Bible? Okay, just want to, do you guys want to hear the jokes that uh, you know, the latest talk show host said or the Bible? Which one do we want? Okay, just making sure you're still with me, right? We came to church to learn about the 
Bible. Okay, so in, in chapter 3, he continues to go on about the revelation that he received because the Ephesians people were crazy pagans. They were false idolaters, worshiping false gods. They literally had the temple of Diana in their city, which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, and it also involved prostitution. How would many people in our culture like to worship a false god as they go to have a prostitute? But that was how they did it back then. They were a crazy bunch of people, and they were also practicing witchcraft, spells, and all of these things, and yet now they're saved. These group of pagan worshipers, men and women alike, have given their heart to Jesus. What an amazing thing. And then now Jesus, uh, Paul begins to talk about that he blesses and prays for them because he wants them to experience everything God has for them, but primarily what he wants them to be, uh, be rooted and grounded in as their foundation is love. And everybody say love. And that's where you get that precious promise that he's able to do immeasurably more than anything we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. Now we go on to chapter 4, and we're going to see how the Gentiles with the Jewish people make up the body of Christ. And that's where he's going to flow into Ephesians chapter 5, that famous wedding passage where we always hear that as Christ loves the church, husbands ought to love their wives, etc. And so often... We skip to five and forget four. And we think that maybe Paul was just coming up with a great example of marriage, but we don't understand that it was always God in the church and marriage came second. Adam first was created to be in union with God. Adam wasn't first created to be in union with Eve. Do you all remember the creation story? God created Adam for himself. Marriage is secondary. Marriage comes after the primary relationship between man and God. And the church is the means of that relationship. So are you married to the church? Are you married to the body of Christ? Because that's exactly what Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 4. There's one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And we're doing that this month. One God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. And that's why he goes on to talk about why it's so important that we have the uh, apostles and the teachers of uh, the apostles, the prophets, uh, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers in the church, people like myself and those serving here today, so that the body of Christ may be built up, that they may re reach a unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, becoming mature. Everybody go, mature. And that word literally is perfect, teleos, becoming lacking nothing to the fullness of your purpose, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's why we're here today. So let's just review before we go on. Paul greets the people. He begins to share with them the great identity that they have in Christ. He then shares with them his grace message. He talks about why Gentiles are so special to the heart of God. He then explains to them that they are a part of the body of Christ in union with Christ for the purpose of changing the world. And there's these workers and ministers that will help that be accomplished. And then now that's where he gets to what we call the nitty gritty. Everybody go, the nitty gritty. Thank you. This is where he starts to say, hey, since you now are in the Lord, don't live as the Gentiles do. Don't do what you used to do. And he names off all of these things. And we call this kind of, uh, you know, Paul's Ten Commandments or Paul's moral laws that he puts in all of his letters. He puts it in Colossians. He puts it in Galatians. He puts it in Philippians. All of these things you should do and you shouldn't do. And he starts off by saying, here's the way you look at it. You were taught in your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to put on the new you in the attitude of your minds and put on the new self created to be like who? When you were born again, who were you created to be like? Like God in true righteousness and holiness. And now he begins to name it off. And if I found, listen, everybody look up at me, please. If I found four or five messages just in verse one, how many messages do you think I'm going to find right here? I could do a whole message just on taking off falsehood. I could do another message, uh, excuse me as I double click there. I could do another message on loving your neighbor. I could do another message on not ang being angry, uh, not sinning in your anger. I could do another message on not stealing, including on your taxes, people. Hello, somebody. I could do a whole message on unwholesome talk and out of course joking, not watching or doing uh, things with your mouth and language that is uh, inappropriate, even if you think it's 
get funny. I could do a whole message on bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander. How many think I should preach a message on slander? About how you shouldn't be doing it. Can I get an amen? How about preaching a message on kindness and forgiveness? Now, once again, why are we doing that? Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Why do we not uh, practice sexual immorality? Why do we wait until marriage? Why do we guard the words of our mouth? Why do we not slander each other? Why do we not steal? Look at it. For God's ex- Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. I'm following God's example. Does God tell the truth or does he lie? He tells the truth. So if I lie, who am I acting like? The devil, not God. So it's not like there's arbitrary rules in the Bible that we just do because God said not to do them. You know, if you go to England, they'll say drive on the left side of the road. We come here in America, drive on the right side. Well, which one reflects the character of God? Well, there is none. Which one shows you who God really is? There is. They're arbitrary. Pick one on every side. Each country can make their own rules, right? When I was in the Bahamas, I had to learn to drive on the left side because they were a British isle at one time, occupied by the British. And, and when I came back here, I went to the right side. Was I more Christian? Was I more godlike when I was over there or over here? Which one? It doesn't matter. But am I more Christian when I tell the truth versus a lie? Am I more like God when I don't steal but I'm generous? Why are those things different than arbitrary laws? Because the laws that come in the scripture are not done for social purposes only. They are done to reflect the very character of God. And that's what you learn in the book of Ephesians is why we do what we do. And then it says there must not even be a hint, not even just a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity. Can I check your Facebook right now? Can I see who you've been talking to? Can I look at your internet browser, see what you've been visiting? Come on, somebody. Can I follow you around next Saturday night with a little camera and see what club you go to or what friend's house you go to? And it continues on and continues on. No immorality, impure, greedy person who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. For these things, the wrath of God is coming. You once were in darkness, now you're as light. Live as children of the light. Wake up, sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And then he gets into how you do it. What does it look like in everyday life? Well, now it's going to start with husbands and wives and the family. Then it's going to go down into the children. And then lastly, it's going to go to your bosses and to your employees and how you treat each other. And then he ends uh, chapter 6 with the armor of God, spiritual warfare, because Paul understands that once you know who you are in Christ and you go against the grain, start living as God calls you to live, he's already locked up for doing that. He knows you're going to face a spiritual battle too. So he says, here's how you fight. You don't fight against people. You don't fight with angry words. You don't go downtown and burn the place down. Come on, somebody. You don't fight by calling everybody that you're a friend with on Facebook a racist and a bigot and an Islamophobe and a homophobe and a, a, a heterophobe. You don't call each other. What you do is you take on the devil. You take it on there first and you destroy the high powers that are influencing these lower powers. And then you fight the battle through love and truth, of course, through truth. But you understand first and foremost that it is the devil's lie that keeps humanity divided. It's a devil's lie that, kill, that wants children to be killed in the womb. It's a devil's lie that has us not understand our God-given gender and identity. Are you with me? And so we fight the battle first there. And then lastly, he ends with his final greeting, Tychicus. Everybody say, Tychicus. Tychicus would be an awesome name for you to name your son. Tychicus is the disciple of Paul who actually brought the letter from jail where Paul wrote it to the people of Ephesus. And he also brought some other letters with him, as you'll learn. And the book of Ephesians ends with his final greetings in one of the most powerful verses you'll ever read in the Bible. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. This is a powerful passage that says it's all about loving God by his grace. It's all about grace and love, grace and love. But one of the sad things that you learn about the church of Ephesus is even though they had no rebuke in this whole letter, no personal names called out as many of Paul's letters do. It's like, you know, stay away from Alexander and Hymenaeus, as he says in one letter. In another place in Philippians, he says, tell these women to stop fighting in the church. And he names them uh, because churches can get messy. In another place, he says, kick this guy out to the Corinth church of Corinthian. Uh, Here he doesn't do any of that. And he actually ends this with grace and love. 
But by the time John writes the book of Revelation, about 30 years after this was written, Timothy then came and pastored this church where the book of Timothy is, is sent to. First and second Timothy is sent to Ephesus as Timothy is pastoring there. All of these wonderful things had happened at Ephesus. They had been set free from witchcraft. They saw God move in a powerful way. Paul spent the most amount of time there, three years pastoring these wonderful people. Timothy pastored them for many years, and they also received this great letter. But 30 years later, by the time Jesus is evaluating the seven churches of Asia, minor he has a message for the Ephesians people and guess what it is he says you guys have been doing good you got a lot of good works you're helping out the poor you're resisting heresy you're not following false doctrine you're you're, you're coming to church regularly but he says I got this one thing against you one thing tap your neighbor and say one thing he says you have lost your first love the very thing Paul ended the letter with Jesus says you forgot that and so may we now understand the book of Ephesians from beginning to end is about the grace and love of Jesus Christ. Are you ready to go into this book with me for the next year? Okay, let's look at today's message in Ephesians 1, verse 1, the will of God. Today's message will be on the will of God, and I believe it will change the way you see the will of God. Ephesians 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Let's learn about the book of Ephesians in summary now. The author is Paul. The date is around 60 AD. The occasion is after Paul's third missionary journey. He took three missionary journeys after his long stay in Ephesus while he was in jail in Rome. It was written around the same time of the letter to the Colossia church and the, and the brother Philemon, and it was brought to the people by Tychicus. The major theme of the book of Ephesians is in Christ. It's mentioned 27 times, either as in him or in Christ. The city of Ephesus was the capital city of Asia Minor, now located in modern-day Turkey. It was the fourth largest city in the Roman world, upwards of 170,000 people. People due to its port location by the Aegean Sea. It had the temple of Artemis or the te or for the goddess of Diana, and that was, as I said before, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, and it had a theater that could hold up to 25,000 people. The church was established when Paul went on his first missionary journey with powerful signs and wonders. And you can read about that in Acts chapter 19, and I would suggest that you do. Just yesterday on my bike ride, I listened to Ephesians twice. I mean, three times. Three times on my bike ride. Get this book in your soul this year. Read it over and over again. Put it in audio. Memorize portions of it. And let me just back up so you can understand. When churches received these letters, this was probably the only Bible they had at that time. Most of them probably couldn't read, and as they met in each other's secret home churches, they would have the letter of their apostles. So if you were a church started by Peter, you would probably have Peter's letter. If you were a church started by Paul, you would probably have Paul's letter determined by your city. So if you lived in Ephesus, probably if I was your home pastor, I would have this letter there, and maybe the gospel that Paul would bring with him, the gospel of Luke, would be his gospel that he would have with him. Uh, the gospel of Mark would be the gospel that Peter would bring with him, and so forth. And so what you would have is probably a gospel and a letter, and that's how you would live your Christian life. Isn't that amazing? Every day they would get together, most of the time every day, and that's a little bit easier than when you're looking at an ancient world or a third world culture, when they all worked within the same vicinity, lived within the same vicinity. It's easy to go to church every day, so I don't put that as a condemnation on us, but they would meet together every day, and they would go over these letters, most of them committing it to memory. And so after Paul's third missionary journey, after he spent three years there, he sends his spiritual son Timothy there, and that's where the books of First and Second Timothy are written. If you want to look at the timeline, as always, our notes are on the app or online at the website or Facebook page. You can see Jesus uh, died and resurrected around the time of 33 AD. Just about a year later, Paul gets converted, knocked off of his horse by a blinding light. He visits Jerusalem, and he talks about his conversion, and they don't really believe him because he was a Jew that was actually having Christian to be killed. That's when he got knocked off his horse, was he, when he was on a road to Damascus to persecute Christians. He then helps bring relief to the uh, people of Jerusalem. He starts doing charitable work. He takes his first missionary journey, and he then goes to Jerusalem again, so he starts hanging out with where the church is there. And then he takes his second missionary journey, and then that's when he starts the church of Ephesus. And then the third one is where he spends the most amount of time in Ephesus for three years, the most amount he spent anywhere 
And then lastly, he gets arrested after he leaves the people of Ephesus. He actually brings forth the elders and says, you'll never see me again. I've got to go suffer for Jesus. And they cry and weep. And I wonder if you guys would cry and weep for little old me. I did wonder. No, I'm just kidding. Little pity patty party. No, I'm kidding. You guys would cry, wouldn't you? Be like, don't go, Tito, pastor. And they actually tried to tell him, don't, don't go. But he said, I got to go suffer for Jesus. Now, y'all didn't cry when I went to the beach, did you? You were a little, like a little jelly. You little jelly when I was in Florida two weeks ago. You're like, past at the beach. How many were happy I got to go to the beach a little bit? Amen. I'm happy you get to go to the beach too, by the way, for vacations. Uh, Paul then was in house arrest. They let him have some privileges. He writes the book of Ephesians. And then he was martyred in Rome around 64 AD by the emperor Nero, who was known to be totally out of his mind. Uh, he took Christians, put them on wooden stakes, set them on fire. That's where the name Roman candle comes from. Uh, he was just a, a lunatic psychopath that was bloodthirsty, blamed all of his problems upon Christians, and literally started doing a Christian genocide across that nation. And during that time, Paul was beheaded. When you look at the ancient uh, world, here's what Ephesus looked like. It was part of what was known as Asia Minor, ruled by the Roman Empire. Here you can see the other uh, major Asian churches that Paul uh, was also a part of, Laodicea, Colossia, uh, Smyrna, Miletus, and I know I'm pronouncing some of these wrong, Thyatira, uh, Traos, and so forth. And most of these, uh, seven of them are main, named by Jesus in the book of Revelation, as we talked about before. So now when you hear the church of Smyrna mentioned in the book of Revelation, or Laodicea, now you know where they are. Most of them were Paul's churches. Here is what the city kind of looked like as, a, as an overview, as a bird's eye view. It looked like uh, pretty much of a metropolitan city of that time. Like we learned, it was one of the four largest cities of the Roman Empire. It was a large port city. It had a stadium. It had a theater. had this temple of Artemis, which travelers and uh, people would come to visit. Also, another thing to understand about Rome at this time, Rome was not divided by colors. Color and these kinds of things became new during the Islamic uh, world when they started to divide people among colors. But the Roman world really wasn't about color. It was more about citizenship and how you were a part of their nation. So you could be an African Roman, you could be an Asian Roman, you could be a Middle Eastern Roman, so forth. And at the same time, Jewish people were very integrated in what we would call races. I don't like that word, but we'll say cultures. Uh, Moses married an Ethiopian. Uh, we also hear about the Ethiopian eunuch in the book of Acts. We, we hear about Simon the Cyrene. That's another part of Africa who, who carries Jesus' cross. And then you hear about places in Asia further towards what we would now know as Asia as China, uh, people coming to faith. And, and, and so these, these wor this world at this time was um, divided among the haves and the have-nots, but not so much according to color. Uh, the haves were basically the Roman citizens, and if you were in the hierarchy of the Roman government, you had some clout. Uh, here is what it looks like today in modern-day Ephesus, uh, the place now uh, of the country known as Turkey. As you can see, it's not uh, too far from Greece. They're just separated by the Aegean Sea right there. And then, of course, if you go this way, you can go into northern Africa. Paul left Ephesus and went to Rome, so that was quite a trip uh, that he took. How many are ready to learn about the will of God today? Amen. If you have more questions about the book of Ephesus, talk to one of our leaders, and they'll help you out. I now want to take on this verse, and like I said, there's probably about four to five sermons I can pull from the verse that we just read, which is this verse, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Where's this, what's the next sermon I can preach on? Paul, the apostle of Christ Jesus, which I probably should have started with. But I didn't really think that was as important to, to get into these other things. But then when I was doing the team talk today, I was like, man, it would be pretty awesome to talk about Paul's conversion, how Paul followed Christ, and how he did what he did. So I think I'm going to go back next week and talk about Paul the Apostle. Today we're talking about the will of God. Then we'll do a sermon on God's holy people, the saints of God. Won't that be awesome? And then we'll learn about the faithful in Christ Jesus. So there's four messages from verse 1. Once again, are you guys ready for the book of Ephesians? It's a beautiful book. It's a beautiful book. The will of God. Everybody say the will of God. Thank you. The will of God can be confusing for some Christians. And I want you to stop right here. Don't pay attention to the notes. Look at me, please. 
Just in your heart, ask yourself, have I been confused by the will of God? Do I not understand it? Do I sometimes find myself, you know, a bit uh, uneasy with what God is doing in my life? Do I not know the purposes and the plans that he has for me? If you've ever struggled with that, don't be discouraged. Probably the will of God is the greatest uh, misunderstood concept of the Christian life. And, and if you say, well, I've never really dealt with it, but if I would track most of your problems, I think a lot of it would come back down to that major category of will of God. So let's say you're dating somebody and the relationship turns bad and you're like, what just happened? And then you read the Bible and you, you hear that everything works out for good for those who love God. And you're like, why was this working out for my good? It was so painful. If you understand the will of God, you'll understand how that relationship went, went bad. As well as, you know, we go through ups and downs in our economy. If you understand the will of God, you can understand how nations rise and fall. If you understand the will of God, you can understand the church and what it's doing upon this earth. If you understand the will of God, you can actually understand women, which I know is like pretty much like impossible to do without the help of God. But if you understand the will of God, you can actually understand women because women were created in the image of God and they have a purpose and a plan. But everything can be understood through the will of God. It is getting hot up here. Nancy, would you get me my towel and some water, please? It got really hot up here for me. I got to unbutton some of these things the moment I said that. So the will of God can be confusing for some Christians because they have a misunderstanding of God's sovereignty. Everybody say sovereignty. Thank you. That's a big word you're going to get defined in just a few moments, but hang on tight if you don't know it. We'll get to it. Though God's will may be mysterious at times, it's a mystery that can be uncovered via our relationship with Jesus. Thank you very much. So Colossians 1.26 talks about God revealing everything we need to know through Jesus. God has always intended for his people to know and understand both his will for their lives and for humanity. Just turn with me quickly to Amos 3.7. Amos 3.7 gives us a promise that God will always reveal his plans to us as it pertains to a life of godliness. Thank you, sir. Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plans to his servants, the prophets. So anything that you need for a good life according to his plan, has he revealed it to the prophets for you? Yes or no? Okay, some of you weren't paying attention. Let's try it again. Any plan that God has for you that you need to know about, has he already revealed it to the prophets? Yes or no? According to the Bible, he has. He's revealed to you the plan of marriage. He's revealed to you the plan of raising your children. He's revealed to you the plan of how to work and earn money. He has revealed to you the plan of how to get along with your enemies. He has revealed to you the plan of how to live a moral life. I could be here all day talking about God's plans revealed through the prophets. Can I get an amen? I believe that. Now, there may be certain things about God's will that he deems unnecessary, and those can remain unknown until his kingdom fully comes on the earth. However, those things are not needed for a godly life. So you may get caught up in asking questions that God said he'll never answer in this world. And that will be a distraction to you. Case in point, God, why did my sister die drinking and driving as a 30-year-old woman with two kids when I see crack addicts who rob people? Not every crack addict robs somebody, but you get my point. Crack addicts who rob people, they're 70 years old and they're still urinating on themselves with no kids. Why is this one alive and my dear sister with two kids dead? God says, I'll give you the simple answer. She did something dumb. She died. Now, if I go, why? Second question, why? He revealed through the prophets why death comes through sin. After that, the second why? None of your business. Now you want to argue with God. You've gone against his word. He said, don't do that. He said, that's none of your business. You didn't make your sister. You didn't make this one. I hold life and death. I told you how it works. Now, you may say, well, she died drinking and driving. That's a little bit more obvious. Well, let's go to a real tough one. This child here dies of cancer. This child has a beautiful life. A seven-year-old girl, she, she has cancer. She, she is just smiling. She goes through it bravely. And it's like, how in the world does this girl get to live only to seven years old, dies in pain at seven years old from cancer, and yet Hitler gets to live his entire life as it is? God says back, right back to us. I created her for a purpose. The purpose was for her to have that life and to encourage us. She's with me in heaven now for eternity. It's fair. It's done. This man was meant to show you the evil of the world. I allowed him to do whatever crazy stuff he did to show you that. And what? 
You see, you have a question after that. Why? God says, none of your business. God loves her, that seven-year-old daughter who died more than the parents love her. God made her for himself. God says she had a seven-year life. Please me. It's good. Glory has been given. Sin came into this world which brought sickness. Not her fault. She was sick. But sickness comes to all people in different ways. This was her. She finished her journey. Now for a million, billion, zillion years, she's healthy, whole, never to be sad again. And what? You get my point? And what? That's what God says back to you. He says, I don't have to go beyond that because it doesn't pertain to you. It has nothing to do with you. How many of you have had to raise children and tell them the same thing? It's none of your business. They keep asking question after question. You say, this is what we're going to eat right now. But don't we have pizza in the refrigerator? Yeah, we do. But we're not eating that right now. Why are we not eating that now? Because I want you to eat this, period. The next questions out of their mouth are not ones of trust. They're not ones of love. They're ones of rebellion, right? And it, for them, will be a distraction. God is God. We're not. He does not owe us the explanation. He's already told us the plan in summary. World started off good. It turned bad. Jesus came to make it good. Everybody put their trust in him. Boom. That's it. You don't put your trust in him. You suffer. So the person who says, that's not fair about the seven-year-old girl. Well, which way do you want to go in fair? What? First of all, give me a definition of fair that doesn't come from the Bible. Only the Bible can define what is fair. That's true. I'll be, I'll be there all day. I don't have time. Bible defines fair. But let's say you go, well, then I don't believe in God then. Well, then nothing at all can be ever defined as fair or unfair. If there is no God, her life is meaningless. Hitler's life is meaningless. Everybody's life is meaningless. Do you understand? You can't cut out the legs and try to make an argument. You're st try to stand and make an argument now. God is the foundation of truth. If you stand here, you stand on his foundation, not to spit in his face, slap his face, or to act like you know better. That's the truth. We're man, he's God. You may say, I don't like that. Well, then that's why you need to repent and be born again because he doesn't care what you like. I'm just being honest. He doesn't care what you like. He's not here to explain to us at a funeral why life and death is handed out the way it is. He just said life and death is mine. Do you trust him? That's the point. Do you trust him? You may not hear that at another church, but you heard it today. Amen? Everybody gets caught up and confused in this. and There's no reason to be confused. There is absolutely no reason to be confused. Don't allow your emotions to cloud your vision of God. Remember, you can be in pain, and I can tell you, let's say right now you go out here, slip on ice, God forbid you break your arm. We could have one of our doctors or nurses come to you and describe the arm that you, uh, the bone in the arm you just broke, the muscles that have now torn. We can now explain to you how blood vessels are rushing all over your body with pain cells and nerve endings and all this. We could explain it to you, or we could give you help. What do you want? Us to stop and describe the human body and anatomy, or to give you help? You don't have enough time in this world and a brain large enough to understand what God's doing, but he'll give you help. That's it. But he'll give you help. That's it. That's all the explanation he's ever given anybody in the Bible. So people are like, well, you know, I don't understand and I don't like that. Well, then you think you're better than Paul. You think you're better than the apostles. You think you're better than the prophets. You think you're better. Don't walk in haughtiness. Humble yourself, as the Bible says, under the mighty hand of God, and he will lift you up in due season. Don't let 21st century Discovery Channel get you to think that you need to call God to court and say, Help, uh, hear ye, hear ye. I'm bringing God to court today. Let's place him on the stand and ask him these questions. Well, God, why did you do this? Why did you, you will find out real quick that doesn't work. But if you truly want to know the will of God, you want to know the creator of life and death, you want to know heaven and hell, you want to understand Jesus, you want to understand sickness and pain, the Bible talks about it clearly. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scriptures God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Somebody say every good work. Everything you need to know about doing good things on this planet has been given through the scriptures. What do I do when bad things happen and I feel like Job? I trust God. Don't blame him. Blame the devil. Trust God. That's what I do. Are you listening? What do I do when bad things happen to good people? Trust God. What do I do when I have a lot of money? Trust God. What do I do throughout this world of death, hurt, and pain, and valleys? I trust God. I trust him. That's what I do. Every good work, I will trust God. What I won't do is turn my back on him.
Peter also wrote in, uh, in his letter, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. As a Christian, you have everything you need for a godly life. You have everything you need for a godly life. Ever live ungodly? I know I have. No excuse can go back to God. It was my fault. Whose fault was it? My fault. Was it the Bible's fault? Was it your fault? Well, they just made me so mad on Facebook. I had to cuss them out to my wife behind their back. This blankety blank member thought they understood me. They don't know. Boop. They don't about boop. Can I point back to you and go, that's your fault? Can I point to the devil and go, that's his fault? Neither the devil nor God can make you do anything. You are a free will creature. You are an autonomous being. You derive your own choices from within yourself. This is the Imago Dei, the image of God within you. You can't blame the devil nor God. Your choice. Choose him for a godly life. And through our knowledge of him, who called us by his own glory and goodness, through these he has given us very great and precious promises that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. All the corruption of the world came from the evil desires of Adam and Eve. Now that corruption, sin, sorrow, sickness, is upon the world. Once again, it doesn't mean that because you sin, now a bad thing is happening to you. That's superstition, and that's also a false belief of karma. That's not what we believe. Bad things happen to good people all the time. What did they do to Jesus? Throw a party for him or crucify him? What wrong thing did he do? Nothing. He served God. They were bad people. What wrong thing did Jewish people do in the Holocaust? Nothing. What did children do to deserve cancer or abuse? Nothing. But why has God allowed a world of pain and child abuse to exist? Because he gave us a choice. And when evil desires came, it brought corruption. Corruption to the natural world through now floods and earthquakes, tsunamis, asteroids, all of these things movies are written about, and corruption to the human soul. For us to hurt and murder each other, your choice, good or evil, what one do you want today? Come on, which one do you want, good or evil? All right, choose good. That's the will of God is that you would choose good. Therefore, listen, everything God wants us to know about his will and everything God wants us to do according to his will has been revealed to us in Scripture and can be fully known by those who ask, seek, and knock. Isn't that what Jesus taught you to do? God, I'm asking for the right person to marry. I am seeking them according to your word. Now that I've found them, I will knock on their Facebook and see what's up. I will ask, seek, and knock. I am asking you to bless my job. I'm going to, uh, my career. I am seeking the place of employment that would honor you. I will knock on their door and email them my application. All of life will be found discovering the will of God by ask, seeking, and knocking. You will not discover the will of God from an, uh, an eight ball, shaking it up and seeing what comes out. You will not discover the, the will of God by flipping through the Bible randomly and putting your finger in a certain place. One guy did that, and he said, God, I don't know what to do. He flipped open the Bible, and it said, Judas went and hung himself. Oh, no, God, that can't be true. That can't be true. What should I do? Tell me now. Tell me now. Go and do likewise. You will hang yourself by that kind of theology. Don't do it. You discover the will of God by ask, seeking, and knocking through prayer, study of his word, and being around godly people who have been at it for a while. Yes, I've missed the will of God. I've misunderstood it. I dated some that I shouldn't have dated, thought about uh, doing things as a pastor that I shouldn't have done, said things, etc. But what God gives us is a way out of our mess, repentance. He won't bless our mess, but he'll let us clean up our mess. He will clean it for us and give us the ability to get out of it. Amen? And sometimes we make our choices, but other times uh, we can always make our choices, but uh, the consequences aren't always up to us, are they? And so sometimes you got to live through your bad choices by the consequences. So ask yourself this question. Did Jesus really intend this prayer to be answered in your life? The prayer that he taught you to pray in Matthew 6, 10. Thy kingdom come, thy what? Thy what? Thy will be done on earth as it is where? How many can pray that with me today? God, I pray for your kingdom to come, your will to be done on earth, in my life, as it is in heaven. That's what's important about this sermon series as we go through the book of Ephesians is understanding that Paul started the whole letter off about the will of God. It's the will of God that he was an apostle. It's the will of God that the gospel should be preached to all the people. And it's the will of God that you are here today for a purpose. 
Now, can I go a little deep with you? Somebody say, go deep. Okay, let me go deep with you right here. I'm going to give you three ways to understand the will of God. Now, those of you who have studied theology may understand some of these terms, but I myself am, am trying to bring forth a new idea, as it were, with some of the things that I believe. So let me give you an example of ideas that are already out there right now. There's a belief called Calvinism that believe God foreordains and determines both good and bad actions. So everything that is good, he has ordained and caused to bring about as well as evil. I don't believe in that. That's theological fatalism. Another belief is called open theism. One that believes that once God created the human race, he limited all of his foreknowledge so that he would experience it literally with us. His only ability to prophesy and give future knowledge is him being an expert and wise person. So it's more like knowing chess plays ahead of time rather than knowing for certain the chess play. It's just being good at chess. So the foreknowledge and prophecies is God basically betting on his wisdom. Both of those fail at the same point. One says that God has to get into every single person's life and determine how they do what they do. So he is literally making the chess, he's playing chess against himself, good and evil. That is Calvinism. And the other one is he's playing chess against a very uh, ignorant opponent and he's so good he can do it on his own without make, and win the game and have them do what, he, what they do without him ever forcing their hand. That's not what I believe. I believe in a place called middle knowledge, Molinism, also a form of Arminianism, which is the idea that God has a foreknowledge of what people will do, and he responds accordingly so that man can be truly free and that he can truly determine what he will do. Very similar to what I had just said, we make choices, but God makes consequences. And I'm going to explain that to you now in this way with these three terms. When you look at God's descriptive will, you're looking at the commands that God gives for all people to do. He's describing what he wants everybody to do. He is speaking to the prophets, as we read in Amos, the plan that he wants you to do. And he says, do these things. That is the descriptive will. But then he gives a permissive will, an opportunity for people to decide what they want to do. And if you look quickly to Jeremiah chapter 19, verse 5, God speaks to them and says, you guys have been so crazy that this never even entered into my mind what you are doing. So it was not my idea. Calvinism cannot be true here. And then open theism is not true because he knew they would do it, but it was never his desire for them to do it. He knew it because he had prophesied it earlier, but it was never his desire. Look at this. They have built the high places of Baal to burn their children in the fire as offerings to Baal. Do you think our abortion clinics are any different than child burning uh, to Baal? No, it's idolatry and human sacrifice, isn't it? And what are they giving their children to an abortion clinic? It's not Baal, but what? Human convenience. It's not convenient for me to have a baby. I got more things to do right now. So their idol is not called Baal. It's called self, isn't it? They offered their children to Baal. Something I did not command or mention, nor did it enter my mind. Now, this is where you have to understand the, the permissive will of God as it comes with the, um, the creative will of God. He's decreeing, live for me, don't be idolaters, don't kill each other, but I have made you free. You can if you want. But if you do, as we will now learn, I will decree uh, what I will do. So rather it's descriptive. I'm telling you not to do it. I'll allow you to do it if you want, but then I will decree what I will do. That is what I believe is the will of God. So somebody says to me, did God know that Adam and Eve would sin? Did God know that, that Satan would fall? If he did, why did he allow that to happen? Because God wanted free creatures with a choice. He could have taken out the permissive will, just made his descriptive will and decretive will, which is this, a Lucifer, I've made you to worship me, now I decree it, that's all you'll ever do. He would never have a choice. Do you get that? He could say the same thing to Adam. Adam, I describe my will to you. Here's the tree I always want you to eat from. Here's the tree I never want you to eat from. I decree it. It's done. He'll never be able to do otherwise. Do you get it? But he added a permissive will. 
a permissive will that allowed Adam and Eve to make a choice. He allowed Israel to make a choice. He has allowed you to make a choice. Now, it is very simple. Don't get, get confused. It is not a confusing concept. When he made these as a part of what we would call the logical sequence of what mankind would do, man's created, man falls, man's redeemed, man's restored, that's a logical sequence, but in his mind, it was all at once because time doesn't matter to God. He created time. He stands outside of time, but God God did not do that arbitrarily. He did that so a people would choose him. And he has tolerated, and the Bible has been patient with the objects of wrath, those who go against him, because it's worth it to him to create a world of pain and suffering if at the end he has a world where people have freely chosen him. Everybody get the dichotomy here. You can have a world where everybody chooses God, but they're nothing more than robots. You can have a world here where people have choice, but the consequence of that, the logical consequence is some people will not choose you. And what are the consequences of sin upon a people? Corruption. Corruption of mind, soul. What is, this, what is the result of sin upon a world? Natural disasters. So he said, two choices within the mind of God. A world where everybody always chooses me because I made them. Evil will never exist. Pain will never exist. But I'll never have people in my image with a choice, right? Because God had a choice whether he would create us or not. So he said, I could take away choice and I can have this, uh, this little dial set, this little make-believe a world that I have with my own creation or I take the chance of evil, pain, suffering, but in that there is good because they choose me. There is love. True love is choice. Can I get an amen? Ask your neighbor, would you rather fall in love or be kidnapped? I think that will help them decide right now. Okay? Now can I give you some of these examples? And today's message will end at 12, so help me God. We will not preach an hour and a half long sermon today, okay? All of that was at the beginning of the year. That was just to shift some people in and out the church. God, make sure you got the right church, amen? Can you take it? Just very simple. Let's go through it because now I want you guys to understand, to stand, understand it. The descriptive will of God. It is my will, God says, that thou shall not murder. The permissive will of man. Man says, it's my will to murder. God's decreative will. It's my choice how I judge murderers because I make the laws and murderers are lawbreakers. Does everybody get that? How about here again in the problem of evil? Here's another example. I want everyone to obey me. Never would have been a problem of evil until Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He says, I want everyone to obey me, but I will permit men to disobey me. Man says, well, I don't want to obey you. And then God's decretive will says, I will make a world where even those who don't obey me bring me glory. Do you get that? Even though Hitler has done evil, it brings God glory because we see the wickedness of man. If you are ever confused in this world what it looks like, there it is. That's why he allows Mardi Gras, so you can look at the wickedness of men. That's why he allows war. You can look at the wickedness of men. If you live in a world that has all of this wickedness and evil, and you're really grieved about it, what you don't do is turn your back on God. What you do is bow your knee before him and say, save me from this world. Anyone who actually sees the evil of this world and runs away from God is doing it so rebelliously because there is no hope for the evil of this world unless there is a God. If there is no God, Hitler won. He killed all these people. He killed himself. Now he becomes nothing. What does he, there's no judgment. What does he lose? What does the rapist lose? What does the psychopath lose? They lose nothing. But if there is a God in the kingdom to come, they lose everything. Are you with me? Now that's the teaching of the Bible. What would you give in exchange for your soul? Nothing is worth your soul. Think of it this way in review once again. If God removed his permissive will, everybody say permissive will. He would have to remove free will. Everybody say free will. His permissive will gives us free will. If he removed his permissive will, he would have to remove free will from mankind. Mankind would be forced to obey God, and thus everything he commanded would be decreed for man to obey. However, however, since God has made man free, he is not responsible for our sinful actions, but only responsible to judge our sin. And I'm going to play this video here. Do you understand? He is not responsible for what Adam and Eve did, even though he made them with free will. People have tried to say God's responsible because he gave them the gun, and now they shoot somebody. No, free will is not determined for you to be bad. He gave them their choice, free, total choice. Just like he said with Jeremiah, it never entered my mind for you guys to kill your children. It was never mentioned from me. You guys came up with that on your own because he gave free will. Can I hear an amen? Let's watch this video in closing, and then we will learn about how to receive the will of God. Evil, pain, and suffering in our world is the most... Let's, 
There we go. The presence of evil, pain, and suffering in our world is the most persistent argument raised against the belief in God. Bye. Usually, it goes something like this. Put your hands up now! An all-knowing God would know evil exists. An all-loving God would want to prevent evil from existing. An all-powerful God could prevent evil from existing. Come here, but here. evil does exist. <laughs> now, given that the fourth proposition would appear to be undeniable, it can be inferred that one of the other three must be false, and thus there cannot be an all-knowing, all-loving, and all-powerful God. Checkmate. Or at least some people think that. However, not too long ago, an American philosopher named Alvin Carl Plantinga put forth a new proposition that is intended to demonstrate that it is logically possible for such a god to create a world that does contain evil. This is how he summarized his defense. A world containing creatures who are significantly free and freely perform more good than evil actions is more valuable, all else being equal, than a world containing no free creatures at all. Now God can create free creatures, but he can't cause or determine them to do only what is right. For if he does so, then they aren't significantly free after all. They do not do what is right freely. To create creatures capable of moral good, therefore, he must create creatures capable of moral evil. And he can give these creatures the freedom to perform evil and at the same time prevent them from doing so. C.S. Lewis would agree, saying, Imagine a wooden beam became soft as grass when it was used as a weapon, and the air refused to obey me if I attempted to set up in it the sound waves that carried lies or insults. But such a world would be one in which wrong actions were impossible, and in which, therefore, freedom of the will would be void. If the principle were carried out to its logical conclusion, evil thoughts would be impossible, for the cerebral matter which we use in thinking would refuse its task when we attempted to frame them. Continuing his defense, Plantinga says, As it turned out, sadly enough, some of the free creatures God created went wrong in the exercise of their freedom. This is the source of moral evil. The fact that free creatures sometimes go wrong, however, counts neither against God's omnipotence nor against His goodness, for He could have forestalled the occurrence of moral evil only by removing the possibility of moral good. So, even though God is all-powerful, it is possible that it was not in His power to create a world containing moral good, but no moral evil. Therefore, there is no logical inconsistency involved when God, although wholly good, creates a world of free creatures who chose to do evil. Alright, let's give it up for Jesus. He's in charge. Well, stick figures are funny, aren't they? Uh, can you put that back up for me, please? Oh, excuse me, I can do it here. Sorry, I can do it. Um, Vinny, would you come to the, the keyboard? I want us to think about that lastly in closing. If God re uh, removed our permissive will, would we really have free will? No, we wouldn't. If he removed his permissive will, you would just be a robot. But you're not a robot. If you look through these three stories in closing, See if you can find yourself in some of your biggest mistakes in the characters that are here. Let's look at Adam and Eve. God says, you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil in Genesis chapter 2. What did Adam and Eve do? Eve goes over there. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good, how many women know you can be tempted by what you see is good? Come on, sometimes shopping may be a little bit of a temptation for you. How many men know you get tempted in that same way? Come on. Maybe not with shopping, but with other things your eyes have, uh, your eyes see, the lust of the eyes. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also, also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. But hold on, God said, don't eat it. But she ate it because she thought it looked good. Can you relate to that? How many things in your life does God say don't do? You look at the thing he said don't do and you're like, that eh, kind of looks good. God says, don't date a non-believer, a non-Christian. You go, but this non-Christian is good. God says, don't get drunk. You say, man, drunk is good. God says, give your tithe. Put me first in all your finances. No, 10%. I can do a lot more with that than give it to the church. They'll be fine. They'll be all right. How often do we make excuses because the thing looks good? Or how do we say it now? Feels good. We desire it. Well, Joe, I, I'm a man, and I desire to have sex with another man. I feel uh, a homosexual, natural tendency. It's, it's, it's desirable. It's not a bad thing. It actually makes me feel good when I give in to it. Never said it didn't. 
The Bible says pleasures can lead to sin. That's an ungodly pleasure. No different than when I get angry, sometimes it feels good to let you know what I got on my mind. Come on. That's how it is with Adam and Eve. But then what does God now say after they ate it? The Lord said this, cursed is the serpent, cursed is the woman, cursed is the man, and from dust you are and dust you will return because he said in the day you eat of that you will die. Everything is found right there in Genesis chapter 3. Don't get confused, people. Go back to the script. Amen? Go back to the Bible. It tells us why there's all the pain. Why do you have to work hard on your job? Because God cursed the work that we do upon this earth. Now you have to sweat. That's why I'm sweating up here, even doing God's work. Why does a woman's, a, a child, the most beautiful experience for a woman and for a family, for a man, for anyone having a baby, why is it the most excruciating pain? Because God cursed the womb. God said, this is the way it's going to be. You're going to have pain in what was the most beautiful thing before. Man and woman, now you guys will be at odds with each other. One will try to use you for sexual dominance. The other will try to use you for, for security and safety. That's all found right here. The world will be at odds with you. Creatures will fight against you now. The world will not be a safe place for you. He said, don't eat it. It looks good. I'll eat it. Now this is what you got. Does that sound familiar to anybody? How about after the fall? Cain and Abel. God takes their, you know, these guys bring offerings. God says to one, I bless this one. I don't want this one. Why did he not bless Cain's offering? Because Cain brought whatever was left over. Now, what does God say to Cain after he says, I blessed Abel because Abel gave me the best of his flocks. God, uh, God said, I blessed him. But he saw Cain was sad. He goes to Cain and the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why are you hating? Why are you jelly? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do what is not right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Some of you think if God came to you right now and said, don't have sex with that girl, don't have sex with that guy, you would listen to him. No, you wouldn't. This man had God talk to him personally. Don't spend money like this. Don't do it like this. This man had a word from God. What does Cain do? Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. Let's go hang out, bro. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. There is no excuse for the wickedness of this world. We choose it all the time on our own. Whether you have the Bible in front of you or God speaking to you audibly, people choose wrong all the time. Now what do you say to Cain? Cain, I'm going to curse the ground because of you. I'm going to curse your hands. I'm going to have a mark on you. And this wasn't what made people black, by the way. The slave cult traders back in the day used to say this is when Cain became a black man. That's why slaves, uh, black people, didn't have souls and they were cursed. No, it was more like a big old birthmark, like right in his forehead, right here, like you are cursed. That's what he did to him. Come on, somebody say, that's the real Jesus. Look at the nation of Israel in closing here. I'm trying to get here as quick as I can. What does he say to them in Deuteronomy chapter 28? If you fully obey the Lord your God. Everybody say, if you obey him, all these blessings will come on you. You obey God, you'll be blessed. A nation, you obey God, you'll be blessed. Stop murdering your children. Stop putting perverse music into your young people's ears. Stop lifting up these movie stars who are perverse. Stop making idols out of the job you work. If you obey me and love me, these blessings will come on you. What do they do? Do you think the nation of Israel obeyed God? Said, sure, let's do it God's way. No. By the time you get to Ezekiel, as they're being carried off by other nations into judgment, as they're being taken into Assyria and Babylon, this is what Ezekiel 3 says, Israel, the people of Israel not willing to listen to you as a prophet, that's who he's speaking to Ezekiel, because they are not willing to listen to me. Nah, 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 I can't hear you, God. I'm whatever gender I want to be, God. God, I can curse out however I want to curse out, because I'm an adult, God. I'll spend my money. Nah, 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 I don't have to go to church. And if I do go to church, I go to that one that tells me I'm always a good person, because I take out the garbage and do nice things for people. Nah, 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 nah. Because they are not willing to listen to me. For all the Israelites are hardened and obstinate. What? You mean they hardened their hearts towards God? You mean it was their fault they became obstinate and rebellious? Absolutely. Now what does God say? Deuteronomy 28 says it will happen. However, if you don't obey the Lord your God and don't carefully follow all his commands and the decrees I give you, all these curses will come on you and overtake you. Let's not be superstitious. Your flat tire is not because of God's curse. Are you listening? The real curses that the Bible is talking about is a lack of joy and peace and a perversion that becomes a natural way of life and an anger and a depression.
depression and something that settles in in your heart as an idol and, and gives you a certain joy, but it's a temporary joy. All those things the Bible talks about as a curse. Bill Gates is under the curse of God. Okay, just don't get confused. Why, why I got money, I must be blessed. No, rich people are under the curse of God. They lack God's true joy and peace and purpose in life. Here's how we discover that purpose. It's very simple. I gave you many scriptures here, but I also want you to follow through with it as we track through the book of Ephesians. I put some there at the end. As, as you listen to Paul talk about the will of God in Ephesians, he's basically talking about you praying, and praying's a two-way street, listening and talking, reading and studying. As a matter of fact, let me just show that to you in, a, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. Ephesians 3, verse 17 says, it's your responsibility to learn what pleases God. Ephesians chapter, I believe, what was it? Was it 517? Yeah, 517. Listen to what he says. It's not my responsibility, it's yours. It says, therefore, do not be foolish. Look at your neighbor and say, I pity the fool. Don't be a fool. Don't be a fool. Don't be a devil's fool. Don't be a Meryl Streep's fool. Don't be a Trump fool. Don't be an Obama fool. Don't be anybody's fool. Don't be my fool. Are you listening? Don't be the Pope's fool. Be wise like God. Learn of God. Therefore, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Can you understand it? The Bible says you can. If you don't, it's your fault. How many know ignorance means dumb on purpose? If you've got real questions, that's why you go to the third part here. You go to a church where there's leaders who are trying to get that information out to you. But you have to apply your understanding. Let me give you a perfect example. My wife will not want to hear this, but here's a perfect example. My son has been getting in trouble with a certain young boy. They are like best friends. I'm not going to call out that young man either. But these two, when they're together, man, they are getting timeouts every time they're together. And I'm telling you, I've had it up to here with my boy coming home from church with timeouts. So we have taken away his privileges. We are putting that paddle to his behind in love and grace. Nothing to leave a mark, but we are doing godly discipline. Are you listening? i got to say that in a world where people think spanking is child abuse. Okay, no marks, but it is spanking. And guess what? I told him very clearly, very clearly on the right here today, do not get another time out. You will not be able to play your video games. You will not go to your friend's house. You will not be able to have treats. You will not be able to stay up and watch a movie with us today. Did he understand what I had told him in the van today? Do you think a four-year-old understood that? Absolutely. He understood. He repeated it back to us. Did he not? And when I went back there to use the bathroom, he was in a time out with that young man, already in trouble. That is ignorance. That is foolishness. Do you understand? It is, if I, if I, don't discipline that, I have harmed my child now. If God does not discipline sin in your life, God is unjust. No different than a judge letting off a murderer saying, well, you didn't know any better. Yes, he did. Yes, she did. We will be held accountable for what we understand in this world. Pray, read your Bible, go to church. Y'all ready for the good part at the end? Save the best for last. Romans 12, 2. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? of your mind. Get rid of that stinking thinking. Let God renew the mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. How many want to live by God's good, pleasing, and perfect will? Can you stand up and give it up for Jesus?